recording has started. Okay, so today I'm going to give a teaching on Das Kapital. I'm not going to summarize the text for anybody. I'm rather going to try to give some uh, insights into what I think is usually missing when people on their own go and read the text, meaning you're still going to have to read the text, you're still going to have to struggle with it, think about it. I'm not going to like, you know, digest it into now I don't have to read it kind of thing for you. But what I'm also going to get at is something kind of autobiographical, which is about why I joined Platypus, and it's actually going to be through this text. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to say is that um, I want this to be as much a discussion as possible. I have a lot of stuff. I don't have to talk about all of it. So please feel free to jump in and ask questions while I'm talking. Just raise your hand just in case I'm in the middle of something so I know to kind of aim towards the ending. So <clears throat> now I'm going to go into my speaking voice. Um, approaching a Das Kapital teaching is highly fraught. The speaker immediately throws himself into the crossfire of a century of debate. I want to give an autobiography to get at what I believe to be something that has fallen out in modern discussions about Marx's critique of political economy, using myself as an object of critique. I'm not going to solve the transformation problem, prove the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, logically or empirically, the problem of accumulation in volume two, the correctness or incorrectness of Bokashia's theorem, the challenge of the economic calculation, the socialist commonwealth, all these controversies, so it's totally fine if you don't know about. Ultimately, the audience will have to read through the volumes on their own, and I do not doubt there are plenty of competent readers in the room, right? So many of you have been in the reading group with, I know you can definitely read. When I was an undergrad at Temple University, so I went to a school down the street, uh, my first interaction with Marx's capital was to approach it as the most complete description of the world that I was born into. I actually had read Keynes's general theory. Everyone knows who John Maynard Keynes is or kind of has heard of him? I guess some heads. Um, some Hayek, so Frederick Hayek, and von Mises' Human Action before I had ever read Das Kapital. I did not doubt that there had been an empirical change since Marx's time. But the laws that were given as an exposition were the laws of the world I lived in. So things had changed, but it was still a good description. I viewed the text as a counterweight to Ludwig von Mises' human action. Ludwig von Mises is libertarian kind of thinker, which was popular at the time and was also considered not reducible to economics, but rather about humanity per se. So he called it uh, praxology. It's about human action. Reading Capital was to me at the time the way to reveal the apologia behind Hayek, Keynes, and von Mises. I read the text polemically as exposing the fallacies of the syncophants, to use this Marx phrase, and I read it with an emphasis on explaining why capitalism was liable to fall into crisis. For millennial who had been shocked by the late 2000s financial crisis, this was the impetus. It was not due to the folly of the government or financial speculation, but due to the very organization of the system itself. So why was I reading Capital? What the hell is happening on Wall Street? Marx is going to tell me. Das Kapital did more than simply explain why a depression had happened, but rather pointed to the imminent, so from within, possibility of overcoming the barrier itself. The diminishing portion of living labor, the active human capacity added to the product, implied that human work could be abolished if this tendency was reflexively used on the production process itself, that work itself could be overcome. That's what that means. This implication was very attractive. Uh, it simultaneously explained the financial crisis, but also it meant that, and I was working at Bed Bath & Beyond when I first read Das Kapital, that my job was superfluous, it was useless. There's no reason I had to be working there. There was one problem. I couldn't quite wrap my head around why Marx kept talking about labor. I would regularly be told by more veteran leftists that it worked in the text, you understand that point? Like, it makes sense in the text, just follow it. Um, this appealed to the totality of the argument, but still, it was something that seemingly no one could explain to me. So, for example, what if you produce a mud pie? Certainly all the labor in the world would not make that valuable, whether it was 10 hours or 12 hours. But, says a learned Marxist, this is what an older person would say to me, Marx notes that a commodity has to be useful and therefore the labor produced in it must be useful to be of value. So that was their response to these little things I would throw at them. But why is something not more valuable the longer it takes the labor to make? Well, would say this Marxist, it's not any labor, but it's socially necessary labor. So we're gonna read chapter one of Capital, he's gonna say it's socially necessary labor. 
A cherry pie costs more than a mud pie because it was socially necessary labor time. People want a cherry pie, they don't want a mud pie. Um, but then it's what is socially necessary labor, I would ask next, like a kind of incorrigible child. Uh, that which is considered necessary by society, done in a socially acceptable fashion. That which is valuable is that which is considered valuable. This is the kind of circle I would walk in when I was first reading the text. One might say, here's another thing that was said to me, it's not Marx's theory of value, but it's Smith and Ricardo's. So with many of you in this room, we read Adam Smith, right? It's his fault, it's not Marx's fault. Marx just showed the implications of their theory. That may be the case, but they might also be wrong, in which case it wouldn't matter if Adam Smith said this and Marx said the same thing. One might say that what matters is the text on its own basis in seeing what the argument implies, but any text can set its end from the start. Maybe the problem is that there's something that precedes labor. Why are we starting with labor when talking about political economy? To labor is to act, and to act is to make a choice. Maybe that is the source of preferences. Could you reduce commodities to abstract utility? So some of you economics majors in here maybe have heard about that. Um, how can one assert that the substance of value is socially necessary labor without already knowing what a consumer values? It's kind of a circular proposition. What about all the products in the world are ultimately products of the sun, right? Sun produced organic life, and it, maybe that's the source of all value. Why does it have to be labor? In fact, all of the arguments I've raised now in these past paragraphs were already raised by Edward Bernstein and the Fabians over a century ago in the 19th century. The point of this digression is not to say that there are holes in Marxist theory, but rather that it was the point of departure for asking what the text meant for myself today. The more I tried to justify the applicability of the text, the more I was led into certain questions about what was taken for granted. For example, infamously, Marx's capital is often saddled with what's called the transformation problem. So I'm just gonna put some visuals on the board. In volume one, Marx talks about commodities exchanging, let's just say labor for labor equal amounts of labor. It took you 10 hours to make the cherry pie. It took you 10 hours to make the blueberry pie. That's why they're eagle. In volume three, Marx then says, well, actually it's capital for equivalent capital. And of course, anybody that's trying to prove Marx wrong is going to say, well, you said this in volume one and you said this in volume three. Right? QED. That's a contradiction. It's all wrong or something like that. So when I was reading the text originally, uh, I would ask, um, you know, what were the solutions to this problem? Because I wanted Marx to be right. And I would hear they would range from explaining away certain confusions. Marx is just talking about averages. Um, thank you. And value was counted at the time of reproduction. This is a guy, Andrew Kleinman, kind of talks about this. To arguments about the sui generis role of money. To finally that... Uh, stuff that said that what mattered was the logical exposition, or at the very least, the fetishistic character of capitalism. So how labor must appear on its surface, it appears as prices, it appears as values. I would get all these explanations for this that were trying to explain away what seemed to be a very clear contradiction that, by the way, was pointed out by the time Marx wrote like any of these texts. People were pointing this out and saying, why is this the case? These arguments were in response to criticisms of Marx, most famously in Eugene von Baumberg's 1896, Karl Marx and the Close of His System. Baumberg's criticism had a specific goal, to demonstrate the inconsistency of Marx's system. Right, so Marx wrote this, this is wrong. I knew that Marx, according to his own words, had taken the postulates of political economy on their own basis and shown the limits as, as value. It was then strange to me that the Marxist economists would seemingly try to demonstrate the validity of the social relation. So just to step back for a second, you know, Marx said, I'm going to take political economy as it is. We're going to see this when we read the manuscripts next week, and I'm going to demonstrate it's contradictory. So it then seemed strange to me when I was reading Capital that people would try to demonstrate that bourgeois political economy actually like was waterproof and they would kind of call themselves Marxists. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm trying to read through. It seemed like they were doing the opposite of what Marx was trying to do, right? Marx is trying to show the limits of this, and they're trying to defend Marx 
by defending the system that he's critically appropriating. It seemed to be the opposite. Uh, for Das Kapital was not given to give a better prediction, but to rather show the limits of, the, of political economy. And I'll get to that later, what that means. Furthermore, it was not even the potential of industrial society or the inadequacy of labor that was unique to Marx, right? So I was talking about earlier learning from Marx that all work could be abolished, and I thought this was a Marxist thing. The left Ricardians, so these are socialist Ricardians, had already demonstrated that labor as value was anachronistic, so obsolete, no longer applicable, and requiring a different form. There's a guy, um, Thomas Hodgkin is a famous left Ricardian, who wrote a pamphlet. Marx was seven at the time, okay? So people had already said it. Um, but they have a kind of insufficient or naive understanding of how to change this, meaning they recognize the problem, but they don't know what to do with it. Hence the necessity of Marxism. It was actually through a conversation with Chris Coutrone, who was the founder of Platypus, the organization I'm part of, uh, that I had an epiphany, right? So Chris Coutrone was on, does everyone know RT, Russian television? Like this kind of news organization? Um, he spoke on it on a kind of a news channel thing. And at the time I wrote, because Chris posted the video, um, Marx critiqued the categories of political economy, I wrote this on his Facebook, uh, the very manner in which the political economists cognize the reality, because he knew that since these categories were socially objective, right, so historically they were objective because everybody holds them to be true, um, that the demonstration of the theoretical crisis would translate into practice. So if you have a critique of political economy, then you could potentially change the world because it's the way in which people understand and act through these categories. So Chris responded to me, and I thought this was very important. This was, was an epiphany for me. Quote, political economy was objective for Marx because it, political economy, was the dominant form of appearance to the workers in their struggle for wages against capital. It isn't today because the struggle doesn't exist with the same acuity it did then. In other words, political economy was how the workers struggled for socialism. They understood the problems of the world through political economy, through Adam Smith and through Ricardo, and the non-identity, like Adam Smith said this and this isn't what's happening, that's because the world is wrong, right? So it was the form of appearance by which the socialist movement uh, struggled with the world. So I responded then, well, but then if there was a return to a Marxist critique of political economy, um, and by that I mean an imminent critique of contemporary categories, not just the forcing of Marx to the present, as many Marxist economists do, um, then what would that look like? Or can we even know? Meaning I was asking him, wouldn't you want to go and give a Marxist critique of your economics class, right, of the categories you're using in your homework right now? In which case, Chris responded to me, Danny, Part of the problem is that without a form of political practice to manifest the issue of capitalism, theory is left as mere methodology rather than proper self-consciousness critical recognition. So it's not a matter of proper methodology, right? just doing an imminent critique of whatever, music, libraries, whatever we want, but rather the forms of appearances, practices, so appearances that's part of practice, are lacking, I think. So around the time that Chris said this to me, I had just read, and we're all going to read it, Karl Korsh's Marxism of the First International. Right, it's two pages. Korsh, keeping with the theme at the time of the writing of the unity of theory and practice, characterized Das Kapital as the theoretical expression of the proletarian socialist movement. Marx had already published his contribution, that's an earlier critique of political economy, but the first international caused him to reevaluate and finish his work. One of the motivations for the publication of the text was the American Civil War, or as Marx puts it in the preface, the slaves emancipating themselves had made common cause with the English and French and German workers who were trying to emancipate themselves from capitalism. So never let anyone say that Marx like didn't know about the race question or something, because literally Das Kapital is being published on this, just to say that. So Marx's critique of political economy was then a critique of the proletarian socialist movement. So it's not that there's a system that Marx is exposing, but it's rather a critique of the 
form of appearance by which the socialist movement struggled with the world. Even when Marx seems to solve conundrums, so writing to Ferdinand LaSalle on February 22nd, 1858, Marx said that his critique was, quote, a critique of economic categories, or if you like, a critical expose of the system of bourgeois economy. And this is key. It is at once an expose, and by the same token, a critique of the system, meaning in demonstrating the kind of uh, constitution of the categories, he's also critiquing it. He's completing political economy and therefore critiquing it. This is uh, when Marx gives solutions, such as the derivation of money in book one, or the reproduction of the social product in book two, or the transformation of values into prices, this is the real point behind this, these solutions are supposed to be scandalous. They're supposed to basically call to attention all of political economy and show that it's become the opposite of what it claimed to be. The law of realization, said Lenin, like every other law of capitalism, and this is key, is implemented only by not being implemented. The laws of capitalism work by not being implemented in practice. They're ideological. They're misrecognitions of what happens. Marx's solution then was about how the law of value is violated so again, the point when people go, oh, this is a contradiction between book one and book three, they're rather picking up on how Marx is saying, this is kind of the self-consciousness of bourgeois society. And the solution is the scandal. But they're kind of accusing Marx of having a problem in his own system, whereas he was taking political economy on its own and showing it to have a contradiction manifest. The general will of society, which is supposed to be founded in labor, can only be expressed as the general dependence of society, violating the bourgeois conception of the general will. This is why it is difficult to treat Das Kapital as some sort of finished accomplishment or economics textbook. As Jeff Pilling put it, Marx did not set out merely to explain the necessity of the social relations of capital. This would be an entirely one-sided view of Marx's work, a work which can, under certain circumstances, transform Marxism into its opposite, into an instrument for justifying these very social relations. The social relations of capitalism exist in a state of relative, not absolute, equilibrium, an equilibrium which must be overcome through the struggle of opposed forces which arise on the basis of these social relations. In this way, Marx grasped always the investigator if his work was to be truly scientific, so that means self-conscious here, um, must place at the very center of his endeavors a conscious struggle to understand his own relationship to the forces being analyzed. This in turn was, for Marx, inseparable from a study of his own struggle in theory and in practice to grasp these facts. Thus, in the Communist Manifesto we read, and we're going to read this next week, Finally, in times when the class struggle nears the decisive hour, the process of dissolution going on within the ruling class, in fact, within the whole range of society, assumes such a violent, glaring character that a small section of the ruling class cuts itself adrift. This is Karl Marx and Engels talking about themselves, and joins the revolutionary class, the class that holds the future in its hands. Here, Marx and Engels were in fact writing of themselves. On the basis of all their practical and theoretical work, they alone at that stage comprehended theoretically and the, uh, comprehended theoretically the historical movement as a whole. They alone had been able to grasp the historical revolutionary significance of the appearance of the working class, the class in itself, which had consciously to be transformed into class for itself. We're reading this in the coming week. Um, yes. The actual struggle to do this, and knowing that every aspect of one's theoretical work was subordinated to this task, as for Marx and Engels, was the real essence of objectivity. Theory could only be developed as an expression and instrument of a definite social force in history. In other words, why does Marx have a critique of political economy? Because the workers have a political economy, that's why. If they had politicized something else, music, architecture, I don't, I just will start thinking of things, it's possible it wouldn't have been Das Kapital, it could have been a different text. It's kind of a key point here. Here is the very heart of Marx's critique of political economy. Not only must the whole of capital be seen from the point of view, but at the same time, it provides the key to understanding how Marx develops his investigation of three volumes. 
so this is now back to me, what ends up happening today when someone tries to use Marx's critique of political economy is that one has to treat the categories as fixed, even if one is describing the contradictions and crises of capitalist society and how potential is wasted and how things need to change. All of this is entirely within left Ricardianism, within anarchism, within Proudhon, right? Something Marx is critiquing. The problem is how one is led to try to prove the account or the approach without having an object of critique, right? Trying to have Marx's critique of political economy without a co constituted proletarian socialist movement. Without the opportunity to give an imminent critique of the proletarian socialist movement, one is sort of backed into a corner. They either have to treat the system as fixed and therefore lose the historical character of the categories. This ends up regressing to a kind of bourgeois political economy or fall into a kind of postmodern view of categories being illusory. They're just kind of like a fetish. Uh, the orthodox Marxists could hold that they better describe reality than the syncophants of the bourgeoisie, because the latter, what Marx called the vulgar bourgeoisie, refused to recognize the ideological character of bourgeois political economy, how it had become ideological. But the Marxists could also use the discrepancy, the difference between what was said and what is, to raise the necessity of seizing the commanding heights of society and transforming the world. So just last night we read Little Man, The Philosophy of Freedom. You could use the distinction between how the world was rationally understood and how it actually played out as a way of justifying the need for, as Horkheimer put it, the rationally organized society, a socialist society, right? Whereas without having an object to give that kind of critique, then you're either trying to give a better explanation, in which case you turn Marxism back into something it was trying not to be, or you just kind of don't make any sense, right? Or you fall into like this kind of contradiction, which doesn't make any sense without the imminent critique. So in order to understand what Marx and Engels find in the critique of political economy, it is important to retrace the steps up to Das Kapital. I'm gonna read a small part and then I'll stop for questions for a little bit, okay? So this section is, what is political economy? First off, what is political economy, or at least what was it to Karl Marx? Political economy, as we think of it today, is often as some kind of science of social organization of production and consumption, but it meant something different in the revolutionary era, meaning it wasn't economics. William Petty, who Marx called the father of English political economy, wrote his political arithmetic in 1676. Petty had served Cromwell during the English Revolution and had established one of the first modern assessments of national income. It's the BEA in America today. The title of the first chapter of his text announces his concern. So, quote, that a small country and a few people by its situation, trade, and policy may be equivalent in wealth and strength to a far greater people and territory, and particularly that conveniences for shipping and water carriage do most eminently and fundamentally conduce thereunto. This is what they had as chapter titles in the 17th century. In other words, what was Petty asking? How is it possible that England, a relatively small and agricultural poor nation, was able to defeat the Spanish Armada and the rival France? That was the concern of political economy. In the same year, Nicholas Barbin published his Discourse on Trade, where he argued that trade has now become as necessary to preserve governments as it is useful to make them rich. Free citizens, Barbin proclaims, will more vigorously defend their nations. Thus, the early investigations which treated the sovereigns like households were concerned with the economization of politics. So what is political economy? Here's one way. It's the economization of politics, bringing economics into politics to make the sovereign more strong. Both Barbin and Petty recognized the necessity of commerce in determining the strength of the sovereign and argued for a laissez-faire economy, right? Free market, everything like that. But here's another side of it. John Locke, writing anonymously, published his two treaties of government in 1689. In the first treaties, Locke demonstrates the obsolescence of the aristocratic claim to land following from being descendants of Adam and Eve. So they would say, well, why do I own this land? Because if you trace my lineage all the way back, I'm the descendant of Adam and Eve. So God gave the earth to them. I own this. I'm the first, you know, first person to come to the land. Locke's claim was that commercial society, bourgeois society, by bringing different people together had intermixed the lineages such that it was impossible to claim that one was the only descendant of Adam and Eve. In other words, the extension of commercial society had rendered the old justification, old traditional feudal society, irrational. 
Thus, the physiocrats, who still based wealth in fertile land, had to incorporate agricultural labor as the subjective essence of wealth. This argument was similar to Locke's letter concerning toleration, you might have read, also written in 1689, where Locke argued that commercial society brought different cultures and religions into regular contact, necessitating toleration. Meaning he literally says, why do we need religious toleration? Go down to the market. You have people of different religions all around there. Thus, in Locke's second treatise, Locke holds that it is self-evident that labor is the basis of property. And I remember going to a debate on capitalism and socialism, and the libertarian said exactly this after me. Why do we have property? If I go up to an apple tree and take the apple off the tree, that must be my property. Otherwise, I can never eat anything. Right? It's kind of common sense. And really, this was the politicization of the economy, meaning Locke took the economy, really took bourgeois society, and politicized it. For the equality established in exchange, if we were exchanging right now, pointed towards something that distinguished bourgeois society from their jealous rivals, the landlords, cooperation. Human rights, or civil rights, became an object because they were literally produced by the new society, the urban society, bourgeois society. I mean, when people exchange whatever apples for oranges, they respect each other's property, they respect each other's bodily autonomy, so the Enlightenment politicized that. It said, this is a practice everyone already does. It certainly doesn't happen in that countryside where the feudal lords are conquering people. And they politicized that as human rights, right? Hence, civil rights, human rights. So to quote Luxembourg, the artisan's struggle against the city nobility in the first part of the Middle Ages depended on the fact that as opposed to the property of the nobility, which consisted in land, they created a new form of property which de depended on labor. The economy had, on the one hand, always existed, right? So always, you know, Xenophon writes about economica um, in a text from ancient Greece, but it's about the organization of the household. So on the other hand, the economy had never existed until modern society. So to quote Marx, among the ancients, we discover no inquiry as to which form of landed property is the most productive, which creates maximum wealth. Wealth does not appear as the aim of production, Although Cato may well investigate the most profitable cultivation of fields, or Brutus may even lend money at the most favorable rate of interest, the inquiry is always about what kind of property creates the best citizens. So the concerns of the sovereign was about, you know, if you lived in a Spartan society, producing Spartans who followed the proper virtues of Spartan society. Whereas if you're in ancient Egypt, if you're in ancient Greece, ancient Rome, it wasn't really about wealth per se, that's a modern thing. Um, yeah, let me keep going. It is with Adam Smith that political economy becomes self-conscious. As Smith put it, a revolution of the greatest importance to the public happiness was in this manner brought about by two different orders of people who had not the least intention to serve the public. He's saying they did not care, but they made a revolution. To gratify the most childish vanity was the sole motive of the great proprietors. The merchants and artificers, much less ridiculous, acted merely from a view to their own interests and in pursuit of their own peddler principle of turning a penny whenever a penny was to be got. Neither of them had either knowledge or foresight of the great revolution which the folly of the one in the industry of the other was gradually bringing about. Right? So merchants went all over the globe just looking for money and they literally revolutionized humanity. That's what Adam Smith is saying. This revolution was not a minor change in habits. The lords despised the burghers whom they considered not only as of a different order, but as a parcel of emancipated slaves, almost of a different species from themselves, meaning the feudal lords considered the people in the city another animal. The emergence of commercial society brought about a turn of mind, right? By working, by producing for exchange, you were causing people to speculate in their daily life all the time. The bourgeoisie literally made the world economical. It made the essence of humans homo economicus, or homo famber, right? I might as well put these up on the board here. So it became a virtue to be economic. This was not a virtue at all in a lot of ancient societies. It was probably the basis for a lot of pogroms, right? They would attack people who tried to make a lot of money. Or this is maybe a little bit broader. Homo favor, right? Like a tool-making animal sometimes, how Benjamin Franklin puts it. Uh, 
Or as Marx and Engels put it, and this is a manifesto, in one word, the bourgeoisie creates a world after its own image. The history of political economy for Smith reflected the different particular interests and principles of the development of modern commercial society. The question was whether or not political economy was going to be representative of this new potential freedom, or whether it was going to be syncophantic to a particular interest, the landlords of the mercantile class. Smith took the intentionality, literally the philosophy of the relations of bourgeois society, to their limit in political economy. If labor was the common sense basis of property, how could one justify the exploitation of labor? The farmers who love to, quote Smith, reap what they have not sown. So Smith is talking about exploitation of workers, book one. Only the fullest achievement of a class society, the form that freedom took, could justify this. Smith's price theory, people argue is Smith correct about prices? Um, this distinction between natural price and market price was the standard of what ought to be. It was what was to be natural in a true class society. So he's taking natural in a certain way. Political economy was the war cry of the revolutionary third estate. So let me just stop there before I start to talk about Marx a little bit more. Any questions so far? We have the introduction, a little autobiograph. I know some people came in also. Any thoughts? Comments? Dis disagreement is also totally fine. Yeah. Just for like more context, what are some of these categories and capital that you've been talking about? Like what are some examples? Yeah. Um, so we can do this as well. So labor is not equal to work. Uh, work has always existed. Animals work. Uh, nature works. What's understood by labor here is working and producing a social relation. And a social relation, by the way, is not an interpersonal relation, like you, you know, your relationship with me, but one that's universally recognized by society. Meaning your work counts in society, right? It has, this is what's meant by value, which is also property, right? So if you walk down the street right now and you ask somebody why, you know, they have $10 in their pocket and you go, why is that yours? They'll say, because I worked for it, right? It's the common sense thing. That's a modern sense of wealth, that you should get something according to your work. Whether or not it's true or not, it's at least a modern sense. That is not true in ancient societies where it, to not work was good, right? In other words, uh, the way in which the aristocrats kind of um, uh, valued themselves was precisely that they didn't work. And there's even a funny scene, I don't know if you've ever seen Marie Antoinette, the, uh, the movie from 2007. Um, where it's so Kirsten Dunst is playing Marie Antoinette is like trying to get dressed and is not allowed to even put clothes on her body. She's, you know, Marie Antoinette because it would be doing work. And so the hand of God cannot do work, only that's for the profane realm for the masses of people. So the third estate, what I said at the end, political economy, political economy is kind of the ideology of the working class, of the working masses revolting. And the capitalists, by the way, for Marx, are part of the revolting masses, part of the working masses. They count as workers, right? Which we'll get to the problem, right? In other words, the capitalists are not part of the priests and the aristocrats or something. They're part of the third estate, those who work. Which is why it's meaningful that things of that revolution play out. So does that help? Basically, when I'm talking about value, I'm talking about labor here. We're talking about the way in which society relates. So here it should be equal work, that's equal pay. In volume three, it's equal capital. If I put $100, if I advance it in investment, it should get the same amount as another $100. That's what's playing out in the stock market. So what Marx is showing is that the kind of desiderata of bourgeois society, the desire, the point, what, like the, um, the ideology of it, has become its opposite. And that's why it's scandalous. All of these people who have like, go, oh, Marx is wrong, he says this in volume one, he says this in volume three, they don't get why it's scandalous. It just looks like it's Marx's economics and it doesn't make sense. And that reflects the fact, and that's why I just read about political economy, that the consciousness of the bourgeois revolution has itself dropped out, right? Meaning Adam Smith doesn't make sense to people anymore, let alone Ricardo, let alone all these other, William Petty, right? 
Instead of being political economy, it's like economics, which is not the same thing. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I'm having trouble with this uh, uh, direct jump from value into property, because I know that Marx describes value in terms of uh, generalized uh, kind of like average labor times, right? And so you have obviously the property of commodities, but what about, uh, I, I have trouble with, for example, like the landed property, right? This transition for applying the laws of value to landed property, um, per se, or, or kind of equating landed property and, and such. Property that doesn't contain within it- Labor. It's labor, yeah. Yeah, so it gets regulated because our relationship to nature is mediated through society. Right. So Smith himself already talked about what regulates rent. Mm -hmm. And for Smith, he, his whole point was to basically say it is labor. So he talks about, he calls it corn, it means bread. And he says it's really the land that is most fertile in producing corn that's um, producing, uh, is setting the rental rate and then the difference from that in that sense. Um, so in terms of the jump there, uh, part of that, and actually I was gonna talk about that later, is the bourgeoisie um, polemicize against the feudal lords who tend to be in the countryside right. as being parasitical, right? So today, um, I was just reading a, a news article on this. Um, you know what a land tax is? This was kind of popular in the last 10 years. Like, oh, we're gonna tax the landlords as opposed to taxing working class people. That's an old idea from the bourgeois revolution, which is that the workers are productive they produce not just their wage, they produce more, they produce a surplus. But what do the people in the countryside do? The landlords, that's what I mean, not the country workers, they don't really do anything. They just appropriate, they get rent, right. basically in that sense. So if we tax them, it should be less harmful. So in a way, the, the rent on the landed property extrapolates out to specifically the generalized labor spent on the things that yeah, contain the yeah. That's part of Smith's critique of the physiocrats. So the physiocrats, who I also mentioned, they know labor's playing a process, but what they're picking up on is that the same labor on different qualities of land is uh, making that same labor more efficient or more productive, and that's what's giving rise to rent. The reason why I'm saying value is property is because what's the basis of property? It's working. Right, that's why I brought up John Locke, that's the bourgeois social relation for property. Whereas the feudal relationship for property was really that you're related to somebody who conquered that land, and then you get it through primogeniture, or you get it through inheritance somehow. So literally two different properties, two different societies were fighting against each other in the bourgeois. Does that help kind of? Two virtues in a way. Yeah, it's, I mean, literally Adam Smith is like, they consider themselves different species. It doesn't, they don't make any sense to them in the cities, right? Yeah. So now I'm gonna go on to Marx's political economy before 1848. It's important to note a background to Marx and Engels' interest in political economy. One might say that political economy was already over, already in crisis by the time Marx and Engels get interested. David Ricardo, the most important political economist after Smith, had to paraphrase shown the following. On the one hand, the principle of political economy is labor. On the other hand, the goal of political economy was to abolish labor. So David Ricardo is made fun of by a French kind of conservative economist who says, well, according to David Ricardo, the wealthiest nation would be those which have a, has like a king on an island all by himself, and he's just kind of cranking a machine that's producing surplus for him. Right? So David Ricardo is already a crisis of political economy. It already starts to disintegrate. Much of what is frequently ascribed to Marx was already said by political economists. As Marx demonstrates in 1844, Adam Smith's doubts seem to have presciently come true regarding the future of the commercial system. John Barton and David Ricardo spoke of the redundancy of labor brought upon by machinery, right? I've been hearing about automation today, right? People are already talking about this in the 1820s. Ricardo for Marx already demonstrated that even the most Distant economic phenomena, this would be related to what you say, such as the rent of a virgin forest, is still regulated by labor time. In other words, it's still appropriated by social beings. And so they have to relate to even a forest that has no labor in it, still through bourgeois social relations. At the time, Ricardo's political economy ended pessimistically for some. 
Ricardo implies that the goal of the economy is to abolish political economy. Ricardo's political economy ruthlessly draws its final conclusion and therewith ends it. Sismondi supplements this ending by expressing doubt in political economy itself. So people are starting to turn on the whole thing as just like, you know, ideology and magic made up by the ruling classes. The Ricardian socialists, such as Thomas Hodgkin, had already demonstrated the inadequacy and anachronistic character of labor as the relation of production and suggested that workers in cooperative production could figure out a better means to organize in production. He's a socialist. Sounds like socialism for me. Richard Jones and even Thomas Malthus, of all people, already suggested that the present stage of production was transitory and pointing towards a higher stage of organization. They already had this idea that we got bourgeois production, came into crisis, and it's created a new form of production. You don't need Marx to get that idea. Utopian socialists had already grasped the irrationality of the present system. Antoine and Lise Chevrolet already suggested that the proletariat rise up and seize the means of production. This is Chevrolet. Capital will ultimately rule the world if an upheaval does not halt the course which will, with the development of society, is taken under the domination of the law of appropriation. Capital will eliminate the old social distinctions everywhere in order to replace them by the simple classification of men into rich and poor, who enjoy themselves and rule, and the poor who work and obey. This is not Marx or Engels, somebody else. The general appropriation of productive wealth and of the products has always been reduced to the numerous class of proletarians to a position of subjugation and political impotence. Today, capital has broken part of these fetters. It is preparing to break all of them. Sounds like it was out of the manifesto. It's before Marx even, you know, reads political economy. In fact, Engels had already demonstrated that political economy could give a critique of its own results. So from the start, and this is like a 20-year-old Engels writing this, Engels writes, the nearer to our time the economists whom we have to judge, the more severe our judgment became. For while Smith and Malthus found only scattered fragments, the modern economists had the whole system complete before them. The consequences had all been drawn. The contradictions came clearly enough to light, yet they did not come to examining the premises and still accepted the responsibility for the whole system. The nearer the economists come to the present time, the further they depart from honesty. This is why Ricardo, for instance, is more guilty than Adam Smith, and McCulloch and Mill more guilty than Ricardo. Um, so let me keep going. So in Marx's manuscripts, and we're going to read this next week, um, Marx vocalizes Adam Smith to sound like a socialist. So Marx will quote something from Smith in the manuscripts like the following. Um, he'll quote Smith saying, we read it all together, um, in the most prosperous nations, um, wages will go to the very bottom and profits will go to the very bottom. But this is likely never going to happen because you know, capital tends to outpace labor and there's always going to be labor demand, basically. He thinks it's a kind of limit that will never be reached, but theoretically it could happen. So Marx will quote that from Adam Smith and then say something like, the surplus would have to die, or hence over reproduction. Or, since, however, according to Adam Smith, a society is not happy, of which the greater part suffers, yet even the wealthiest state of society leads to the suffering of the majority, and since the economic system leads to the wealthiest condition, it follows that the goal of the economic system is the unhappiness of society. What Marx is doing here is he's kind of vocalizing Adam Smith to sound like a socialist, and he's putting him alongside other communists like Wilhelm Schultz or Constantine Pecor. This is important because it looks like in Marx's time, Adam Smith is simultaneously condemning the current social organization and affirming them. It looks like Adam Smith is contradictory. Marx would later say in his theories of surplus value, Smith's successors take opposing stands based on one aspect of his teaching or another. So you can have people arguing over Adam Smith and they say the opposite thing. What Marx is getting at here is that Smith has become contradictory and that consequently the recrudescence of bourgeois political economy is now coming through the socialist movement. Meaning Adam Smith is being reproduced and repeated through the socialists. Right? In other words, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations is the image of socialism to these workers. It's very important, and it's why Marx has to have a critique of political economy. That is the ideology of socialism. 
So as Marx puts it later in the Holy Family, all treaties on political economy take private property for granted. This basic premise is for them an incontestable fact to which they devote no further investigation. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Indeed, a fact which is spoken about only accidentally as say, say naively amiss. But Proudhon makes a critical investigation, uh, the first resolute, ruthless, and at the same time scientific investigation of the basis of political economy, private property. This is a great scientific advance he made, an advance which revolutionizes political economy and for the first time makes a real science of political economy possible. Proudhon's treaties, what is property? Where he kind of famously says property is theft, right? This is in the Marx Engels movie when they're talking to Proudhon. Is in, as important for mo modern political economy as he is, is what is the third estate, which we all read together. Proudhon takes the human semblance of economic relations seriously. He takes labor, the active side, seriously, um, and sharply opposes it to their inhuman reality. So what is Marx saying here? Proudhon sides with labor against private property. But what is private property? Labor. labor. So a as is shown in the Marx-Engels movie, you know, Marx is kind of coyly talking to Proudhon, and then his wife just goes, what we're saying is that you're like a shadow ch chasing its own tail or something like that. I forgot the exact phrase. Meaning Proudhon says, what is property? Property is theft. That doesn't make any sense. Because in order to have theft, you need property. So our own work is starting to uh, confront this as something coming from without. So what is the socialist movement? It's labor critiquing labor. Or as we got it from yesterday when we were reading the letter to Ruga, communism is a dogmatic abstraction that's infected by its opposite, private property. Right? The communists are saying we want to end private property. And really what Marx is going to show in the manuscripts is they're actually going to extend private property to the highest degree that's ever been possible. It's actually going to be the fullest realization of private property. And we'll get into what kind of that means. This is a running theme of Marx and Engels during the period of self-clarification. They came to realize that there is a certain exhaustion to imminent dialectical critique, at least in the classical revolutionary bourgeois sense. Thus, Marx and Engels um, say to the young Hegelians, well, so this is what one of the uh, young Hegelians say, the modern worker thinks only of himself. He allows himself to be paid only for his own person. It is he himself who fails to take into account the enormous, the immeasurable power which arises from his cooperation with other powers. So the young Hegelians literally say about the workers, the problem with them is they're not dialectical enough. They don't recognize their social cooperation produces powers that go beyond their individual labors, right? They should read Rousseau or Hegel. This naive dialectical view treated the underpayment of the workers as a result of their one-sided consciousness. But Marx responds that the workers are, quote, painfully aware of the difference between being and thinking. The appearance of one-sided thinking rather expresses the one-sided character of the situation, and that's what could potentially propel workers with their active intervention by communists. This is why Marx reads into the Salesian Weaver's Rebellion the potential for a theoretical and conscious character. What was blocked was the possibility of critically engaging with the productive process. I mean, the problem with the workers is not that they're not dialectical enough, but rather the social situation prevents them from recognizing their own uh, social being in society. So we were talking earlier about value as this is uh, the kind of social recognition and social um, powers of relating by working. This is what the third estate is, right? So there's always been work, but bourgeois society was based on the relation of work. Capitalism is that our own social powers now confront us as coming from without. They seem to actually even be the actions of other people, right? We were just reading The Little Man in Philosophy of Freedom yesterday, that little aphorism. Yeah, go ahead. So are you saying that during Marx's time period, the proletariat represents the social being and not the bourgeoisie anymore? Uh, I mean, the proletariat is bourgeois. Right, the bourgeoisie is the capitalists and the workers altogether. The point is, is that what the workers are struggling with is their own product. Mm 
right? So hence the term, <coughs> the owners of the means of production are exploiting us. Uh, that's a misrecognition of the problem. It's actually an older problem that's kind of projected on into the present. So the way that the serfs uh, kind of fought against the, the feudal lords was that their labor was being exploited, right? In other words, the bourgeois revolution is to say, uh, the feudal lords are exploiting me because I have to pay them tribute, right? I have one of the corvée systems and you know, three days out of the week I have to give them some kind of tribute or some kind of food or something like that. And that's an exploitation of my labor and I have the right to the full proceeds of my labor. That's a very important phrase that we're going to see when we read the Critique of the Gotha program, because it comes back in the socialist movement amongst LaSalle, who I mentioned earlier. Meaning LaSalle is repeating the old call of the bourgeois revolution under a new condition and hence misrecognizing the problem. So, yeah, yeah go ahead. This is totally unrelated, but it's 8 p.m. and I parked up front. Are they going to, like, tow me? Does anyone know? Like, just on the street here? The, the street has these 3 a.m., uh, has three hours, like 8 a.m. to, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. thing, because yeah. I also parked on the street. should be fine. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay, no yeah. um, That's fine. Any other questions so far? The, the point being that the famous line, social being determines social consciousness, is a misrecognition of the worker's own labor, is confronting them as something coming from without, and in a sense, Individually, the workers have to kind of capitulate or have to kind of accept the misrecognition in practice, right? They accept their own labor as capital, as that which is employing them. Is that clear to everybody? It's almost like if you're, you were to treat your own shadow as actually the truth of yourself. And it's not like a thought mistake, it's that in practice, this is actually how a crisis of social relations manifests itself. Any other questions over here? So let me just get into uh, 1848. So I'm doing a good, you know, I'm going to summarize also some of the readings that we're going to do, kind of set them up. So before Marx even began writing the Grundrisse, he had already concluded what he thought was his new contribution, the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat. This is important to keep in mind in judging all subsequent developments. While the ancient proletariat lived at the expense of society, modern society lived at the expense of the modern proletariat. Despite the value of one's labor being nil when, they were, when you're unemployed, meaning you, your commodity, your ability to work, counts as zero if you can't get a job, right? If no one's willing to hire you, it's equivalent to as if you didn't have the commodity at all. But even despite that, the modern proletariat have rights as citizens, meaning they have a right to vote, they have a right to democracy, right to elections, to suffrage. They are exploited, whereas the ancient proletariat by today's standards shared in the exploitation of those who work. So the ancient proletariat, in a sense, actually were part of the parasitical groups that were taking surplus off of the people who worked. Uh, the social quality of labor that it meets the average productivity and quality of the kind of concrete labor and the capitalist quality of the social labor that it meets a quantity beyond the wage became ever more impossible to meet. Hence, unemployment as a permanent phenomenon is really the crisis of bourgeois society. So Adam Smith never expected that there was going to be permanent unemployment. Importantly, this is not an economic process, but it looks like an estrangement of a right. Right? In other words, it literally looks like your right to sell your labor is being taken from you. It looks like a crime in that sense. It looks like a democratic revolution is necessary to restore the usurpation of a person's inalienable rights. So right in the Constitution are inalienable rights. That's a right to actually choose who to sell your labor to, even if it seems like there are not much choices. That was not a right that ancient society had. You were not allowed to sell your labor. This also means that democracy became contradictory under industrial production. Democracy, as one person, one vote, bore the same equality of property owners in exchange. This raised the task, quote, this is Engels, a drowning man clutches at any straw, nor can he wait for a boat to push off from the bank and come to his rescue. The boat is socialist revolution, the straw, productive terrorists and state socialism. The overproduction of value 
is further intensified by those workers thrown to the curb who use their political rights to ameliorate the consequences of contradictory civil society. In other words, why do we have universal suffrage according to Marx and Engels? We have universal suffrage because we have unemployed people. And so unemployed people cannot rely on an employer to recognize, to uh, represent them politically, right? They're unemployed. And so they rely on the power of the state. There's a very famous line from the 18th Brumaire, they cannot represent themselves, they must be represented. I Meaning for Marx, democracy is actually an expression of con contradiction and crisis of modern society. The National Assembly, representing the autonomy of the nation versus its heteronomy, voted to abolish universal suffrage on May 31st, 1850. This was a coup d'etat of the bourgeoisie, as Marx puts it. In restoring suffrage for the democratic masses of France, Louis Bonaparte had preserved their value of their labor, their possibility of integrating into society. In order to lead a democratic revolution, the proletariat would have to meet the demands of the people drowning, but in a manner that could potentially go beyond bourgeois society. Is there a question over here? In other words, what I'm saying right here, and we're going to see this in a few weeks when we read the 18th Brumaire, what Marx and Engels witness in 1848 is a socialist revolution. They witness the expropriation of the capitalists. They witness something that looks like the workers are organized to expropriate the capitalists. He, Marx talks about shooting down the bourgeoisie on their balconies with grape shot in order to save capitalism. So democracy saves capitalism, really socialism saves capitalism in 1848. Right? And this is actually what's driving Marx's impetus for a critique of political economy. Because what looks like what's wrong in society is the way in which society is deviating from classical political economy, right? which the workers are reproducing in their struggle against the capitalists. Because for the workers, the capitalists are not like Adam Smith and Ricardo. It's rather the capitalists are the usurpation of the natural rights that have been laid down by Adam Smith and Ricardo and John Locke. Or as Marx and Engels put it very early on, there's a straight line from John Locke to communism. Oh, that factory's labor? That's our factory then, the end. Right? So you have to have the, the critique of political economy, which was the consciousness of the bourgeois revolution, is being reproduced by the proletariat but under changed conditions, and that makes it ideological. They're ideologically replaying out the bourgeois revolutions, but in the factory. And that's why they're spontaneously reaching for political economy. Value for Marx was constituted not by the time needed to produce it by itself, but in relation to the quota of each and every other product which can be created in the same time. So this is why I kind of put up here property. I mean, what is value for Marx? but one's kind of social standing in society. And so, as Marx is gonna talk about it next week in the manuscripts, proletarian labor is defined by the workers, the harder they work, the more value they destroy. It's the opposite of John Locke. If John Locke said, what's the basis for that property? You mix your labor, like this kind of language. Marx is saying, now John Locke has become upside down. The more you work, the less you are the less property you have. And hence, consequently, the workers are actually reacting against that because it looks wrong. It's the harder I work, the less I count. This is the opposite of anything rational. This meant that value was a producer's social standing with respect to the rest of society. It is only the fetish of commodities that makes it appear to be a quality of things rather than our relation or even non-relation to society. By comparing our labor with others, we determine how we sit in social production. It is only in exchange that the social character of the capitalist production process becomes explicit and intelligible, although this shows it was very implicit even in the isolated production. It is a very superficial reading of the 18th Premier to think it is about the peasants and urban gangs from a demographic standpoint. The Industrial Reserve Army included both. Right? In other words, Marx's point is everybody's replaceable in capitalist society. And as long as there's somebody who wants a job, there's the possibility to reconstitute bourgeois society. It was from this that I get the view that Das Kapital is a book about democracy, really about the crisis of democracy. As Lenin would put it many years later, the issue is this, 
Which of the main forces, the proletariat or the bourgeoisie, will these intermediate sections join? There cannot be any third way. He who has not understood this from reading Marx's Capital has understood nothing in Marx, understood nothing in socialism, but is in fact a Philistine and a petty bourgeois who blindly follows in the wake of the bourgeoisie. Right? In other words, Lenin is just saying, what's the point of Das Kapital? It's a book about democracy. Right? It's not a book about explaining, I don't know, the economic system or something like this, or explaining why Adam Smith is silly, but rather political economy was the form by which the workers were struggling for their own emancipation, a contradictory form of struggle. And thus the question of democracy itself was a contradictory question and required as I said earlier, the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat to lead it. So really the entire text is about the dictatorship of the proletariat. So I'll just stop there right now. Um, any questions so far? So is that what uh, Marx and Engels mean when they say, like, win the battle of democracy? Right, so in the manifesto, which we'll read next week, they don't say we're fighting for democracy, they assume democracy is already there. And that democracy takes on yet a more, a more important character in the 1848 revolution. So democratically, the people of France vote for Louis Bonaparte, who's the counter-revolution, right? But he can validly claim to be representing the will of the people and to even be carrying out what looks like a socialist revolution. So he expropriates the capitalists. He's called a socialist by his opponents. They say socialism has triumphed. Um, he himself calls himself a socialist. He writes this book about poverty and exploitation. And yet Marx is like, this is the counter-revolution. And one other thing I wanted to say, you know, the famous line in the 18th premier about, I, I know you have a question as well. Um, even the smallest bourgeois reforms are called socialism. So expropriating the capitalists and expropriating the means of production, these are all bourgeois reforms. It's completely within the rights of the state to do these things. Right, we got it from Rousseau, the state's the last guarantor of private property. And yet, to even do one hundredth of that today, as we saw from the debate, would be called full communism or something. Right, so communism is really the bourgeois revolution haunting itself. Or it's really the haunting of the bourgeois revolution of modern, you know, sub-bourgeois society, and that is the way to put it. Yeah. Okay, so I was going to ask, um... The way you presented it, you emphasized a lot that the that dust capital is really inseparable from the workers' struggle for socialism. And so, in the absence of that today, what what is the status of this work, if not an economics textbook or an account of the way the world works? You know, what does it mean? Right. So I think what you just said there is how people must almost necessarily treat it if they try to make it relevant in the present. I try to bring up what I thought was assumed by Marx in his critique of political economy as a way of disenchanting the kind of uh, current appropriations as it, of it in order to raise the broader history as a critique of the present. Right. So in other words, I know some people walked in, platypus we look at the history of the left and sort of what's become of the left over the last hundred years. In my opinion, Das Kapital has become a text about economics because the left and the proletarian socialist movement have liquidated themselves. And so hence the object by which we could make sense of this text is not there. And so naive people like myself, this is why I said this is kind of a self critique of myself, when we go to read those texts, we can't help but treat it like an economics book. Right, it's like, oh, you read the first chapter and it's like, oh, isn't this value? And Marx is gonna talk about prices and stuff and he's gonna talk about business cycles. Doesn't it seem like this is an economics book? Um, so, you know, I, I, I think the status of Das Kapital can serve as a critique of the death of the left in the present. And that's why when people try to use it, I think they really repeat Adam Smith. But that's, does that make sense to everybody why they would repeat Adam Smith maybe? Yeah, so it's kind of tasking us to politicize the economy in the way that it, it once was. Or that's politicize true. society in some way, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, the, it's not enough that theory should tend towards practice, practice should also tend towards theory. Mm -hmm. 
Meaning when Marx wrote that, you can critique practice as it is, as falling below what it potentially was in the past. So in the past, practice was mass socialist movements that really had the possibility of the socialist revolution. We don't have that today. And that doesn't make, that should not be used as an affirmation of the present. Like, oh, okay, that was then and this is now, and things have changed, right? It's like a random number generator, like we just have a different draw, and so now it's different conditions. Because of course, history is continuous in some way. I mean, what about the past has been passed down as moments that have been unrealized potential? That was good, yes. So, if one were a worker in the time when this book was published, like, what do you think the book is calling for workers to do, if not to struggle for a larger share of the labor that they're producing? Wait, the, in, the, in Marx's time, yeah. kind of, what, what was it calling the workers to do? Yeah. A dictatorship of the proletariat. In other words, the kind of crisis that Marx draws out what they're taking as a moral um, usurpation. So I gave an example of Thomas Hodgkin. Thomas Hodgkin writes a book called Labor Defended. And he says, the problem with the world in the present is it's not following Ricardo. It's wrong. It's literally a conspiracy of the capitalists and the government. And consequently, we should reform society in order to you know, move it into the natural state of things, the correct state of things. What Marx is doing is saying that seemingly moral uh, discrepancy is actually a function of history, and it's actually a way in which you're tasked to take up the reins of capitalist society. In other words, the dictatorship of the proletariat is the workers taking responsibility for capitalism. They're going to organize capitalism, they're going to organize the capitalist factories. It's not the end goal, but they have to do it in order to overcome it. So, you know, one of the last lines of Capital, it's not the very last chapter, but it's the second to last chapter. The last line is the expropriators will be expropriated. And so people take it as like, this is Marx and his like, you know, by the way, I'm still a socialist kind of thing. No, Marx is saying that the way in which capitalism preserves itself is the expropriators are expropriated, right? Meaning 1848, the capitalists are expropriated in order to save capitalism. Hitler expropriates the capitalists to save capitalism. In the Polish Revolution, they expropriate the capitalists to save capitalism. So the question for Marx is not is that expropriation going to happen, but who is going to do it and for what reason? And so the reason why there would be a necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat for Marx is because the workers expropriating the capitalists would set the stage for the overcoming of that problem, potentially. That's, that's, that's the Marxist hypothesis, right? That's the new thing. Um, and that's what he's trying to get at through political economy. Political economy is in crisis, not because people are dumb, but because the world has actually created a new potential that outstrips the era by which those categories made sense. They made sense in Adam Smith's time. They made sense still even in Ricardo's time they no longer make sense, they've become ideological. We were reading that weird little Marx dissertation thing last night that I think was making people's heads spin, right? It's Marx's notebook and his dissertation about the young Hegelians. And he says, alien harps only play when there's a storm. There's a crisis in political economy, not because people are dumb, but because the world itself is in crisis. And so Adam Smith looks like he's contradicting. And so that's the opportunity for a critique. That's why Marx says Proudhon misrecognizes everything. And now we have an opportunity to have a critique. Mm -hmm. Right? This is the real opportunity. Yeah. Um, this is kind of going off an earlier question. But you talk about Proudhon and Marx's critique of that. And that's why it was like a productive critique. So would uh, maybe our task in the present to reform like a Proudhonian type socialist movement. You know, when Platypus started off, one of the like slogans was uh, not not reformulate, but like reconstitute the conditions of critique. The conditions of critique were the party for socialism. We were also talking about this last night. 
meaning a party is not the solution to the problem, but it's actually a means of bringing to bear the phenomena of capitalism and giving an opportunity for the class to critique them and learn as a class from them. Right. So in other words, when I said that Marx saw Das Kapital as being the kind of theoretical expression, he's assuming, he's taking for granted that there is an international workers movement. Right. This is during the first international. Literally, the workers in England are intervening to stop their own government from intervening on the side of the South in the Civil War. Right. Because they're relating to the slaves who are being emancipated as workers. And of course, Marx's own friend, uh, why, I'm forgetting his first name, it's Weidemeyer, Joseph Weidemeyer, Joseph Weidemeyer, who Marx writes a letter to, is a union in the colonel, a colonel in the Union Army. And he's like handing out Marx's inaugural address, meaning there's an idea of like, oh, this is a world revolution. And so what Marx has to do is give the imminent critique of the socialist movement in order to set the task concretely for the dictatorship of the proletariat. So then what becomes of capital when that's not there? Well, this is what Austin was getting at. It looks like it's an economics book. You know, it's like, like I said, when I read it, I'm like, oh, I guess this is why there's like a housing bubble. Maybe. I guess it's Marx who explains it. I mean, I guess he sort of does, but that's not really the point of the text is to explain housing bubbles. Other questions? Like, did you have a question? Um, I, I I feel like I'm I'm not entirely sure that I feel like I'm convinced with the idea that it rem almost reminds me of Amadeo Bordiga the concept that communism is the struggle against democracy in in some ways. Um, uh, I, I don't have a quote specifically in order to back that up, but <laughs> the. Uh, I, I feel like I have trouble with this concept that specifically uh, that uh, capital is kind of explaining, uh, not explaining, but critiquing uh, the, 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 the power of democracy in, in a way, uh, the constitution of democracy and, and categorical sort of terms in, in terms of exploring its contradictory dynamics. Um, uh, which don't necessarily follow any formula, as Marx kind of obviously believes. He doesn't seem to think that there's like some formula for how the economy works specifically, but that there are dynamics that play against each other at times. Uh, does this kind of, are you kind of saying that in a way, a lot of the um, uh, Marxist or Marxian kind of econo economistic uh, economistic readings are really super misplaced, really, that's what you're trying to say. Uh, so I guess I'll say a few things. I wouldn't say Marx is against democracy any more than I would say for democracy either. In other words... Uh, I'll say, I'd qualify bourgeois democracy, sorry. Well, no, I'll just say democracy in general. Yeah. In other words, like, what would be meant by proletarian democracy, like when Lenin uses this in his polemics with Kautsky, is who constitutes democracy? Right, which would be different than is it like who's voting? Um, and so this goes to the what I'm getting at in terms of capital is Marx is saying that a democratic revolution is going to happen. A democratic revolution is a bourgeois revolution. And the question is who is going to lead it? Is it going to be led by a Bonapartist? And this is going to come up in two weeks when I read the 18th Premier or something like that. Or is it going to be read by a class organized vis-a-vis -vis a party, a proletarian socialist movement? So it's not a question of like a democratic revolution or not, but rather who is going to lead it and then for what end in that sense. That's because the basis of democracy, um, like I said earlier, the one man, one vote kind of thing, that comes out of the rights of civil society, right? In other words, who are members of uh, the community or the citizens? those who are property owners. In bourgeois society, anyone who has labor is a property owner. That really means anybody, actually, right? I mean, that, that's why grounding property and labor as opposed to land was actually something that opened up possibilities for everybody. This is why John Locke basically thinks he's putting an end to all of these like previous forms of subordination, 
by saying is in property, common sense, and labor. So democracy is the political expression of these kind of civil rights, then, in that sense. The basis of labor, right to bodily autonomy, to sell your labor, everything that comes out of it, the right to deal with your property um, as you please. So it's not a question of is one for or against that, but rather after the Industrial Revolution, bourgeois social relations become contradictory. And that's why I was saying earlier that Locke seems to be turned on his head. And the expression of this that Marx gets from the French historians is the class struggle, right? Meaning labor versus capital, or as Marx puts it in capital, when right meets right, force decides. So what the state is doing is stepping in to try to organize democratically a contradiction in civil society because civil society cannot regulate itself in the way that Adam Smith and Locke and all the political economists thought it could. So what's coming up in, so I'll, I'll get to your other point as well, what's coming up in terms of the question of democracy and why Marx has his critique of political economy is because he's trying to say the workers, your interest in emancipating yourself from being a class, right? it's not to rule as a class, but to emancipate yourself from being a class, requires you to lead a democratic revolution and lead all of, as Lenin was putting it, the intermediate forms, which can be other workers. It just means the workers that are not organized. Um, and actually, uh, I have some other things. Can I read some a little bit more? Because I just wanted to talk about some points to remember. One of them is Das Kapital is about the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat, but I got some quotes on this. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the primary contribution of the text is not about predicting recessions or the obsolescence of the social relations, but rather explicating the task of the dictatorship of the proletariat through the history of political economy. Right. So all the footnotes in Capital are references to to quote Engels when. Uh, when the categories were adequate consciousness. So when Marx is saying, oh, this is what a commodity is, and he quotes Dudley, you know, Sir Dudley North or Locke or Barbin or these people in the first chapter of Capital, and he's saying 1720 whatever or something like that. It's an expression of the emerging bourgeois society. And then as he describes the contradictions, you'll see the history will change to the vulgar political economists more contemporary. So he starts to quote people like, um, uh, who's the guy at the end? That I'm he'll, he'll just quote like John Stuart Mill or something like that, um, or kind of vulgar, Nassau Sr., these other vulgar political economists from his time. So he's showing the way in which bourgeois society has become opaque to itself over time. Or he'll quote the factory inspectors and show how bourgeois society reflects on itself. The capitalist system is the system of proletarian consciousness. As Rousseau had already pointed out in the critique of the social contract, the proprietor in the final instance is society itself. The question then was rather who would do the expropriation and how. Expropriation can be justified in defense of bourgeois society and the continuation of capitalist production. Two, Das Kapital is about democracy, not about the morality of democracy, but rather the crisis of democracy. Uh, the, I have something I got to quote. Oh, here it is. Here's the quote. This is from volume three. Um, Such a general rate of surplus value, viewed as a tendency like all other economic laws, has been assumed by us for the sake of theoretical simplification. But in reality, it is an actual premise of the capitalist mode of production, although it is more or less obstructed by practical frictions causing more or less considerable local differences, such as the settlement laws for farm laborers in Britain. But in theory, it is assumed that the laws of capitalist production operate in their pure form. In reality, there exists only approximation, but this approximation is the greater, the more developed the capitalist mode of production, and the less it is adulterated and amalgamated with survivals of former economic conditions. In other words, just to step back from this kind of very verbose quote, what Marx is saying is that the laws of capitalist production are most clear to the degree that there is a class struggle that there's proletarian consciousness. In other words, the tendencies are most uh, law-like, they're most intense, they come into their own, they seem to operate the most to the degree that the workers are politicizing the capitalists instead of being kind of liquidated in petty bourgeois democracy. 
So even when Marx talks about pure economic laws in the most technical parts of volume three, he's talking about democracy. Right? So the, the truth of his theory, in a sense, is the degree to which there's the intensity of the class struggle. It's a political text, right? even in the most technical equalization of profit rates. Um, yeah, sorry, you had a, no, I don't think I answered the second question. Can you say it again? Uh, it was about um, uh, that you are rejecting economistic readings. Of, like, the, for example, I don't remember the name of the guy, but he tried to formalize in terms of like analytic philosophy, like Marx's dynamics. Cohen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So is it a rejection of them? I would say that it's a misplaced ascribing to Marx something that he didn't do. I would say that what people rediscover when they read Das Kapital is like Adam Smith and Ricardo, mm -hmm. and then they treat it as if it's Marx. Right. In a sense, on the one hand, Marx kind of doesn't say anything new in Capital, which I'm not throwing him under the bus. I'm actually saying, because in a sense, the point isn't really to explain anything new, but to rather bring historical consciousness to the entire history of bourgeois consciousness, which is what I'm saying political economy is. It's the war cry of the third estate. Yeah. May I, 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 think, yeah. I think that for me, at least personally speaking, when I read, it feels like the novel thing and obviously i'm not from the 18th century so it's impossible for me to really say unless i study like a crap book but that it's specifically the fact that class struggle appears as a regulative element really and also the conception of uh the abstraction of value specifically acting as as a um something that uh, tends to order politics beyond politics so let me say two things about this. The first thing you say, that's great, because in other words, all the laws of classical political economy are now all political, right? Which is already shows the violation of them, right? So when Marx says, um, when right meets right, force decides, that chapter, chapter 10 of volume one, he's saying that you cannot separate politics from these so-called laws of civil society anymore. I think a lot of actually, you know, we saw Richard Wolff debate Aaron Brook, I think they kind of try to do that. They try to say, here's politics over here, and here's the laws of civil society. And no doubt, maybe the state will intervene and try to mess with it, but it can't actually like overcome these laws. It has to be done in some kind of social manner. No, what Marx is saying is that the crisis of civil society after the Industrial Revolution has necessitated politicization for the mere preservation of bourgeois society. Right, you can't separate politics from that. And so going to the second question about labor, like abstract labor, right? Mm -hmm. Or value in this sense. So the laws of, of value, who are producing the laws of value? It's the workers. In other words, the workers are posing a question to themselves in Marx's view. Because as long as there's one person who needs a job, that's enough to restart bourgeois social relations. But those relations have been racked. They're obsolete, they're anachronistic. They're, they've been burst asunder, is the term that Marx uses in chapter 32. And so what the workers are doing is they're literally replaying out the bourgeois revolution. And so they're actually kind of reposing the conditions of bourgeois society to themselves again and again. That law character is in a sense a kind of necessary misrecognition of their own domination, right? And that's why Marx and Engels and Luxembourg and Lenin will say things like, um, the law has the character of being like the law of gravity. So their own activity, their own social being confronts them like, like gravity, right? It's like something you don't have control over and is determining your consciousness, meaning that you act under that presupposition. Right? Like, you know, you stop at a stop sign because you're like, that's the law. You're not like, oh, I have an opportunity to transform this law, or even I am transforming that law, which is kind of the problem with industrialization, with socialization of production. Did you have a question, or I was going to read another quote? I'm going to read another quote that will go to that. So this is Angles. This is from um, the uh, Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. Socialized production revolutionized all the old methods of production, 
but its revolutionary character was at the same time so little recognized that it was on the contrary introduced as a means of increasing and developing the production of commodities. So you ask somebody about the industrial revolution, what did it do? It brought science and technology and we can produce way more stuff than we could in the past. What Marx and Engels and all the socialists are saying is it qualitatively introduced a contradiction that undermined bourgeois society. So Adam Smith spoke in a pre-industrial situation, even Ricardo still, and after them, there had been a revolution that undermined basically the society that they had argued for, essentially. Right? And so this is the misrecognition. In other words, the kind of famous Marx thing about the contradiction of forces and relations of production, industrial forces of production, socialized production, and bourgeois social relations. Or they'll say independent, like uh, independent or individual private property in these kind of terms. It's a historical contradiction, right? It's like, you know, I don't know, 1500s bourgeois society. I know it, you can go back a little bit further as well. Bourgeois social relations, and then like, let's just say late 18th industrial revolution, like around the time of the French Revolution. And so what Marx is seeing is in a sense, he has a great phrase somewhere where he says the 16th century, or the 19th century repeats the 16th century. Con capitalism for Marx is like a repetition of an older moment that's reconstituted through the way in which a new potential of society is bursting out of the social relations and compelling people to try to put it back together. Right, when the workers ask for a job, right, they're trying to reconstitute bourgeois society when that social relation is anachronistic. Marx is saying that we could have ended, you know, we could have abolished work in the 19th century. And actually all sorts of people are saying that. The utopian socialists are saying that. So yeah. are you saying that this like contradiction will be like mediated in the dictatorship of the proletariat? Right, yes, okay. exactly. And the critique of the Goethe program is good on this. Could you explain that a little more for myself and other people? Yeah, okay, yeah. so, all right, so who exploits the workers? It is the workers, that's what Marx is showing, right? In other words, they misrecognize the capitalists as exploiting them, but really it's the socialization of production which has thrown workers out of society, the Industrial Reserve Army, and it's the competition between the workers, this is kind of the early way Marx Engels used to describe it, which is leading the workers to exploiting each other. This is a lot of what volume three is actually about, is how they exploit each other through the market in a very mediated way. So the issue in a sense is that the contradiction is not tractable, everybody understands what's meant by that? Like at the very best, you can go to some library on a Thursday night and hear some random kid and some teacher and talk about a historical contradiction, it's not anything you can politically work with, right? In other words, what Horkheimer was saying last night is that to even take up this contradiction, you need to rationally organize society such that this contradiction could be politicized. So the point of socialism is not that it solves the problem, but it actually brings it to the forefront because it's a crisis, it's a contradiction of civil and political society. And so it requires a dictatorship of the proletariat to politicize labor, to actually take up the contradiction of labor and capital. What Marx is gonna get at in these 1844 manuscripts is the expropriation of all the means of production is gonna proletarianize everybody. It's actually gonna create, it's in a sense gonna extend the problem, universalize the problem, Everybody is going to be, as he's going to call it, universal capitalist and universal worker. It's going to politicize it. And we might have multiple parties and socialism kind of fighting over what is to be done. But it would bring out the way in which labor is actually dominating itself. Right? This is why I said, well, what is capital? And I think you said it's labor. Right? This is the past labor of the workers. Or as they put it in the manifesto, in present society, the past dominates the present. 
the past dominates the present. Dead labor, past labor, accumulated labor, these are the terms. And yet it's not merely accumulated labor. It's the Industrial Revolution has qualitatively changed it such that this seems to be the real agent of society. That's what Yaron Brook was kind of saying. He goes, well, actually wealth is produced through ingenuity. There's a kernel of truth to what he's saying. He's saying that what the Industrial Revolution has uh, brought into being is the possibility of using the general intellect of society and putting it in motion. And so what he's falsely ascribing to the capitalists, although there's a kernel of truth there, is the social power of society. But then he takes the other side, which is then he talks about like bourgeois, he literally said John Locke at one time. So he's just walking through a contradiction naively and doesn't recognize the problem. Were you gonna say something? No? Any questions so far? Is that clear? And maybe that's a lot right there. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're sort of saying that if if you're a worker who's competing with other workers for a job, then mm -hmm. you're part of the problem. But you know, what else can you? Ask? Nobody can do. I mean, that is the thing. There is no like. That is the kind of Marx point. Yeah. Like in the short term, you you need a job. So. Right. Mm -hmm. It, Marx is not there to say you're a, you're like part of the problem in a morally condemnatory fashion. In other words, this goes back to the question about democracy, meaning it's the task of the workers to lead a democratic revolution because people are going to want something like basic civil rights and basic, you know, like a job. Like in other words, the way to overcome work is by giving everybody a job. That's kind of the Marxist communist thing. Because, you know, I don't know, in 1848, let's say 90% of the people were not like organized by communists, they just all of a sudden there was a revolution. And somebody's just gonna want a job because they're not gonna wanna starve or just have some income. And the workers can give them a job as part of their more general program of actually overcoming a job. Right? Maybe the first thing that will happen in a dictatorship of the proletariat is you'll give everybody a job because you don't want anybody to be unemployed and go and join the counter-revolution. Because right? what happens in 1848 is there are unemployed people and Louis Bonaparte goes, oh, I'll give you a gun and food and money and courtesans to go and shoot the capitalists. And they do. And they're like put on people's shoulders and paraded. Right? Like, in, you know, if it's not going to be the workers who are going to do it, it's going to be the counter revolution who's going to give you a job to shoot workers or shoot capitalists or shoot anybody. So, yeah, I mean, in terms of, it's not about individually you're a bad person if you want a job because you can't expect anybody, it's outside of their freedom to do other. So, how, is, how are the workers morally responsible, not as individuals, but as a class? because then it's within their freedom to take up capitalism. Any other questions? I have a lot of other stuff, but I don't need to. I'm mean, gonna have something on surplus value if people want. Or... If nobody else has any questions, uh, a slight digression kind of from where we were in terms of the topic, but uh, I'm curious uh, if you've written kind of in your presentation about method, about, um, or if I just might have missed it before I came in, uh, because it, it does feel to me that while Marx is kind of following at times the premises of the political scientists uh, that um, he's also rejecting sort of like the, the scientific method that they followed to reach those conclusions because they obviously created contradictions. And uh, I was curious if you had uh, anything to kind of say on kind of Marx's method here. Yes, thank you for asking. I, I literally have a section called the, the method in that sense. So this will be a way of also getting at the other side, which is Hegel, right? And 
Hegel and Smith as well. In other words, Smith actually has a very dialectical method that Marx follows in uh, Das Kapital, but in a certain way. So Marx infamously, or you know, famously, that's something you ask, mentions in his 1873 afterward that his method is, quote, not only different from the Hegelian dialectical method, but its direct opposite. Marx characterized Hegel's dialectic as one where the process of thinking is the demiurgos of the real world, whereas for Marx, the ideal is nothing else than the material world reflected by the human mind and translated into forms of thought. This can give the impression that Marx is merely flipping, like a camera obscura, Hegel's dialectic the other way up. But this passage follows from Marx quoting a review of Das Kapital. So he quotes a, a Russian who is uh, giving a review of Marx. The author of the review noted that Marx is concerned primarily with demonstrating not only the necessity of the laws in the present, but how these laws transition from one form into another, from one series of connections into a different one. The reviewer praised Marx for this. Marx responds by noting that while this is a generous reading, what the author is picturing is not Marx's method, but the dialectical method. It is here where Marx begins to differentiate himself. Marx writes, quote, of course the method of presentation must differ in form from that of the inquiry. The latter has to appropriate the material in detail to analyze its different forms of development to trace out their interconnection. Only after this work is done can the actual movement be adequately described. Here's the important part. If this is done successfully, if the life of the subject matter is ideally reflected as in a mirror, then it may appear as if we had before us a mere a priori construction. Thus Marx is stating that if he has been successful, it should seem that as one reads through capital, they are just following a logically consistent chain. It should seem to be a mere a priori construction. But the logical chain of categories as presented bears the stamp of history, despite appearing self-evident in their a priori construction. So this goes to following the method of the political economists, which is what Proudhon did, basically. Proudhon had tried to give exactly this kind of construction nearly 20 years prior. Here's Proudhon. The fundamental idea of the dominant category of political economy is value. Consequently, value appears under three aspects, useful value, exchangeable value, and synthetic or social value, which is true value. The first term gives birth to the second in contradiction to it. It's very Hegelian, right, because Proudhon says Hegel is one of his masters. And the two together absorbing each other in reciprocal penetration produce the third. So that the contradiction or antagonism of ideas appears as the point of departure of all economic science, allowing us to say of it, parodying the sentence of the Tertullian in relation to the gospel, credo quia absurdum. There is, in social economy, a latent truth whenever there is an apparent contradiction, credo quia contrarium. From the point of view of political economy, then, social progress constitutes in a continuous solution of the problem of the constitution of values, or the proportionality and solidarity of products. This sounds a lot like chapter one of Das Kapital, right? This is Proudhon saying, what I'm going to do is take the category of value and dialectically unfold it. Here Proudhon is saying that he is going to demonstrate the imminent dialectic, dialectic of the commodity form. What Marx wants to show is that the logical chain that Proudhon believes is the product of a critical theory is in fact given by capital. Social being determines consciousness. In other words, that which seems to be a priori unfolding from political economy itself is rather a reflection of the real process of history, right? This is the kind of term that Marx will use, or he calls Das Kapital a work of natural science. So just to step back for a second, when Marx is saying that capital is a work of natural science, he's saying that bourgeois society became exactly what it claimed to overcome, which is unconscious to itself. So nature would mean unconscious there, and society is the negation of nature being rendered rational. So when Marx says capital is a work of natural science, he's consigning bourgeois political economy to prehistory, whereas it was supposed to be the rationality of society. In other words, bourgeois political economy as categories, as modes of existence, are also supposed to be reflections of the consciously produced relations of society. Right? In other words, labor as consciously produced 
as having an intentionality, not consciously like an individual decides, but as society itself, that there's an intentionality to labor, going back to John Locke. That why is it that we would respect your property rights? Because you're preserving the resources that have been given plus more. And that's the justification for property. What Marx is getting at is that the categories of political economy, the, the famous phrase is you have to invert them. It's not that it's a causal thing, but that they've become inverted according to their intentionality. Now labor does the opposite of what it was supposed to do for John Locke. It destroys property, right? It no longer makes sense according to the intentionality of the social relations. And, it, and that chain that Proudhon is kind of uh, playing out right there is how bourgeois political economy has become ideological. Meaning Adam Smith, in a sense, does Marx's method already in 1776. He starts with the simple, and he unfolds it, and he has a dialectic of logic and history intertwining. Right? You can just look at the structure of wealth of nations. He starts with labor. He says, as there has been accumulated labor, then you have stockholders and employed laborers, and they get a surplus off of that. And then he brings up the market. He brings up the market price. He has a natural price, which is how things ought to be. Um, Chapter two then switches places and it goes from the market, it, it goes from production to the market, right? And so therefore he's taking the standpoint of the buyer and seller. Chapter three, he gives a historical grounding to the categories that he has of political economy in the opening books. Chapter four is the further history of the bourgeois revolution, right? It's on the East India Trading Company. And five is finally that he's come all the way up to the state. So in a sense, Marx's method is already there in Wealth of Nations, on the one hand, right, at least how it's often described. The problem is that to do that now would be an affirmation of capitalism. That's what's meant, you know, this phrase like idealism and materialism. If you try to do that now for Marx, you're Proudhon, meaning Proudhon tries to make sense of the world by starting with, as he thinks, simple categories right, simple, pure categories, and really he just ends up being an apologia for society. Because you have to treat all the problems as kind of mistakes of society's own, uh, like, consciousness, right, misrecognitions in that sense. Um, what Marx is saying is that, no, the Industrial Revolution has actually outstripped that which is rational for us. It, we actually understand it more as irrationality, it's the anarchy of production, you know this term that he uses in capital, right? He says the anarchy of production and the despotism of the factory. That's a reflection of reification of the misrecognition of, I'm going to put other things up here. Um, the base industrial production. And the superstructure, which we, we can just say is bourgeois social relations. And so we understand the problem of the uh, inadequacy of bourgeois social relations to grasp industrial potential through bourgeois society. And hence, bourgeois social relations seem to take on their opposite meaning because they're trying to grasp something that outstrips it. So labor comes to seem like the opposite, right? All these things like that. The falling rate of profit, right? This infamous thing. Falling rate of profit's good for Adam Smith, right? It means reinvestment, it means competition, it means there's not monopolies. Falling rate of profit becomes a problem for Marx, right? All the categories come to have an opposite meaning. Um, yeah, other, other thoughts? And that, that goes to the dictatorship of the proletariat question. Meaning, why do we need that? We need that because we need the workers to pursue the problem that's being produced by capitalism. Right, meaning capitalism destroys property, and so the workers need to follow that. Right, whereas when they're asking for a job, they're actually trying to restore property in a certain sense. They need to consciously grasp that process to emancipate themselves.
one more thing for everybody. I know it's uh, people are reaching a limit, but. I don't even know if I have this actually. Okay. Uh, I, I, this is just going to be an ending of. This will be an ending. And this will be the famous. Because uh, this is something that, that was big in uh, like the last decade in terms of Marxian economics, right? This, this kind of phrase. So this is on the law of the rate of profit. And I'm going to use this as an example of the liquidation of the socialist movement is how this has changed its meaning in the last 120 years, ready? Okay. So the liquidation of the proletarian socialist movement and therefore the clarity of Marx's critique of political economy can be demonstrated through a popular concept of Marxian economics, the long run tendency for the falling rate of profit. Historically, the law has had a different significance based on the capitalist era. Marx considered it one of the, quote, greatest triumphs over the donkey's bridge of all previous economy. Competition was supposed to be the sole defense against the capitalists. This is how Adam Smith kind of says, what could justify the exploitation of the workers? It would be competition because that would actually be a way of facilitating a dynamic in society. In other words, it would ultimately be for the benefit of the workers. Right? In other words, he says, people are going to try to exploit each other anyways. This is why I could justify it. And the falling rate of profit was supposed to compel the capitalists to reinvest their surplus back into socially beneficial investments. Marx's triumph was to show that competition leads to the dependence of the producer on the product. This is the transformation of values into prices. And a blind alley where neither capital nor labor can be used to their full potential. So both are blocked. Machinery is blocked by capitalism. It wasn't an, an explanation for depression nor a fatal blow, but rather reflected the transitory character of the means of organizing society. So Karl Kautsky of the Second International received this clearly. The falling rate of profit did not lead to a, quote, downfall, but the narrowing of the capitalist class. Luxembourg, too, did not ascribe anything final to it. One is not too sure exactly how the dear man envisions this, whether the capitalist class will at a certain point commit suicide and despair at the low rate of profit, or whether it will somehow declare that business is so bad that it is simply not worth the trouble, whereupon it will hand the key over to the proletariat. However that may be, this comfort is unfortunately dispelled by a single sentence by Marx, namely the statement that large capitals will compensate for the fall in the rate of profit by mass production. Thus, there is still some time to pass before capitalism collapses because of the falling rate of profit, roughly until the sun burns out. <laughs> By the middle of the 20th century, the classical theory seemed in doubt. Shane Mage, writing in his 1963 dissertation, I interviewed Shane Mage last year, noted that Marx had assumed that with the rising organic composition of capital, exploitation would increase. However, the possibility of a falling rate of profit due to falling exploitation while it may have had no real precedent in the 19th century, gained a precedence in the 20th century explosion of the bureaucratic administration. I mean, this older Marxist that I interviewed last year, when he looked at Marx's falling rate of profit in the mid 20th century, he said, well, we have an administered state now. We have all of these state bureaucratic officials. And something that Marx could not foresee, whether or not this is true, what the falling rate of profit meant to him was the statification of society. It did not mean the concentration of capitals or the Adam Smith question. It meant the statification of society. By the late 20th century, the crisis theory was itself in crisis. Michael Heinrich set forth a challenge that the theory of the tendency of the rate of profit was to fall was an exaggeration spread by Engels, editorship of volumes two and three. As James Hartfield points out in a 2008 Platypus article, several socialist groups in the 1980s sought to disprove Marx's theory of the falling rate of profit in order to justify their support of state spending. However, the 2007-2008 financial crisis created a surprising sudden popularity in Marx's crisis theory. Marxists became quick to, quote, exaggerate the crisis tendencies. Since then, Marxist theory, theorists have emphasized the centrality of Marx's um, theory of the falling rate of profit. I think I have more to that, but I lost it. But anyways, my point there is that if you look at like the last, I don't know, 100 and 
50 years of Das Kapital, you can see all these different ways in which just one thing that really only makes up three chapters in volume three has meant all sorts of different things to different people. And so likewise, just coming to the ending of this teaching, Das Kapital has meant all sorts of different things to different people. And I think we can ask, you know, going back to Austin's question, why does it mean what it means to us today? And how does that bear the defeat of the left from the past and the present? So I, I know I have more, but that's it. Yeah. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. Any questions? Comments? I mean, I have more questions, but I think I just <laughs> need to read more Marx now <laughs> and kind of actually get into the material, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the term. Um, uh, what was, was it? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, the... Uh, not the sublation, but the um, uh, the um, uh, the way that labor is um, made. Uh, that Marx differentiates subsumption. Between, subsumption. That's yeah. the word I was looking for. So I remember um, reading uh, uh, in notes one uh, talking uh, about specifically. Uh, I, I was I was curious if you had anything to talk about specifically in the social theory that this transition between absolute and relative subsumption of labor, uh, which Marx kind of talks about specifically in terms of the material forces and not in terms of a social relationship. Uh, but kind of if you, if you uh, had anything, uh, uh, any thoughts about um, this kind of idea that uh, we could maybe periodize uh, capital due to this specific tendency to where, uh, hey, we have this relativistic expansion. Well, we have this absolute expansion, which then transitions into a relative extraction uh, as kind of run, run, out of run out of running space. Right, so this is a reference to, there was a lacuna, a kind of uh, unpublished uh, uh, ending, uh, to one of the chapters in Das Kapital that was republished later called Direct Results or Immediate Results of the Production Process. It's really good, by the way. It, yeah, and it, it also actually has a, a great ending that, uh, of, of that as well. A lot of stuff, it's kind of writes, it reads a little bit more like the Grundry, so it's a little bit more uh, abstract in that sense. And he uses these terms, formal and real subsumption in those. Yeah, that's it, that's it. Yeah, and I, so I guess I would say a few things. One, in terms of, with respect to endnotes, I mean, people who read the Das Kapital and the Second International, they understood what was meant by that, even if Marx didn't use the terms formal and real subsumption in the main body of the text, meaning the chapters 13, 14, and 15 are basically Marx periodizing the emergence of capitalism proper from what he calls cooperation, this is like Locke and Rousseau, manufacturing, which is what he calls Adam Smith, and then really what people understand by capitalism is chapter 15, it's large-scale industry, and that's when, as he puts it, the machinery seizes upon the tool itself. Or in other words, in Smith's time, the uh, kind of, what we would now call the general intellect, the kind of powers of society, were basically embodied in the workers' cooperation. Right, so the division of labor, the principle of it was the workers. You know, it's these, the examples he gives at the beginning of Wealth of Nations that we're reading, when he talks about like, um, well, you, you divide down the tasks and it allows all the workers to focus on it and it, not only are they more efficient, but they can actually produce new sciences and new technology because it gives them an opportunity to contemplate in a way that they can't on their own. So in chapter 14 of Das Kapital and manufacturing, in Smith's time, it's still not proletarian labor, right? It's the workers, um, when Smith talks about wages, he talks about the workers replacing their tools and materials. It's not constant capital, variable capital, in the way that Marx talks about later. So in terms of that periodization, I would say that really what people are getting at through there is the difference between, let's say, Smith's time and Ricardo's time. In other words, the real subsumption is reflecting the proletarianization of society, 
the leveling down of everybody to one thing. Really, value comes into its own in the way that we understand it because it becomes non-identical with wealth, right? In other words, value doesn't actually capture the wealth of society, the potential of society, but it's rather the bourgeois intelligibility of, of the potentials of society, but that's also why it's restrictive of that which has come up in the Industrial Revolution. Um, and that periodization, I think it can work. I think sometimes, I think it can work. I just think sometimes people turn it into something that's like newly discovered and therefore they have some understanding that the second international did in or something like that. No, that's what the editorial at the end, end of one basically says. Yeah, and that I disagree with, but I think that it, chapter's great. I think it's wonderful. I think it has a lot of great nuggets and all sorts of great things. Um, I had some stuff on surplus that I was going to talk about, and one of them is from that when Marx says it's surplus labor to the worker, but surplus value to the capitalist, meaning that's a non-identical thing. And uh, yeah, I think it's a great chapter. I think that periodization is fine, as long as it's not kind of used as something else. Is what, kind of what EndNotes tries to do with it, maybe. Well, it was a yeah. it was theory of communist, I believe, that was it was just specifically a reprint of. We um we read some post Stone and Martin Nikolaus in, during the summer. So we read a neo Marxist era. And when the Grundrisse was published, they thought they were able to jump over the Second International because the Grundrisse was not published in their time. Mm -hmm. And so they thought they were, you know, to quote Martin Nikolaus, the unknown Marx. They were discovering something about Marx that the failed internationals didn't know. And I would rather just say they were rediscovering Marx under changed conditions, but it's not like the Second International didn't know about real informal subsumption or something. You know, they were, they were fantastic readers of capital. Same with the Third and Fourth Internationals. Um, and in fact, whenever there's a crisis in Marxism, people always say, we need to go back and read capital. So Trotsky has the Stalinism and Bolshevism, and he literally has a section that is like, oh, well now people are telling us because of Stalin we have to go read capital. And he's like, Capital's a great text and everything, but there were plenty of good readers of it in all the internationals. You know? So it becomes a kind of like bugbear of like, why did the revolution fail? People didn't read Hegel's Logic, or they didn't read Das Kapital, or they didn't read the manuscripts, or something like that. Um, I don't think that's the case, and I also think the text maybe become opaque because of the way in which practical organization liquidates itself and so it means less or it, it becomes more abstract um, in that sense but yeah in terms of the periodization I think that's like fine that's one way you can think about it um, yeah because what that's basically saying is that everything that was supposed to it's basically saying the workers have been rendered superfluous that's what it means yeah. Um, Max Horkheimer, right? After the Industrial Revolution, uh, workers have been rendered superfluous, but not work. Right? That's the problem. And that's what creates authoritarianism, because then people go, I'm not going to go and starve, so, you know, the state better do this. Right. So you go from formal subsumption, and you have wages and these kind of basic characteristics, but under real subsumption. Uh, it's more along the lines of the, the, the value is kind of the principle. Formal subsumption is like, uh, like Smith, but Smith thought that was productive, meaning he thought the workers pressing their wages was part of the social process of extending the development of society. So yes, the, you know, he talks about farmers will give work, like workers stuff, and then he says they love to uh, reap what they didn't sow, he, and Marx literally says, right here, Adam Smith, surplus value, like straightforwardly. For Smith, that was an unsocial sociability, right, the Kant that we read, meaning that the, the antagonistic interests of the workers and the employers was a way of actually generating wealth for society as a whole. What happens after the Industrial Revolution is that struggle, in a sense, becomes uh, it hollows out and actually blow, uh, blocks both parties from realizing their ends. So the capitalists are also infected. 
right? The workers obviously are, and they suffer most viscerally from it. But the capitalists, I mean, this is why we're reading Little Man and Philosophy of Freedom, the worker goes up to the capitalist and goes, give me a job, and the capitalist goes, I can't. I, like, it's literally out of my freedom to. I, um, I would have to go bankrupt to give you a job. And the worker goes, fuck you. Right, like you're greedy, like this is why. And so that's social disintegration. That's not what Smith or Kant or Hegel consider basically the unsocial sociability, the private vices, public virtues of Bernard Mandeville. That's the disintegration of society. Everybody suffers, nobody wins in that sense. And so what's happening with the real subsumption is the potential that's supposed to be facilitated by bourgeois social relations has become undermined. It's been actually socialized. So I, I had a quote by Lenin I didn't read where Lenin basically says, in every economic crisis, we learn that society is more socialized than we thought. So the financial crash in 2008, okay, what was the basis for that? Um, we had given out houses to act as collateral on the asset side of banks, and that was kind of giving the conditions for cheaper lending and lower interest rates. And basically what had happened is that when interest rates were raised uh, and these people who had mortgages could no longer pay them, it rippled throughout the entire economy because basically those houses were being used to buffer the asset side of all these investment banks, which were tied to bigger banks. It was mainly smaller banks that were uh, giving out uh, these kind of investments. And it ought to have been the case in kind of Smith's time that if you had a bubble in one part of the economy, it would be bad, but it wouldn't shut down the fucking world. No, that shut down the fucking world. That's because society is more socialized than is actually grasped by bourgeois social relations. It's more interdependent, right? And hence we get absurdities like, we had so many houses in 2008 that people who lived in houses could no longer live in houses because we had too many houses. Doesn't make any sense, right? But that's because those houses were being uh, kind of built and, and you know people were having mortgages lent to them as a way of actually setting the conditions for capitalist production as a whole, right? Setting the financial conditions. And that's why a bubble in a small part of the economy could ripple through and shut down the entire world. or thoughts? Nope, too much? Okay. Of course you can always, if you have other thoughts or something, yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs>